Connie Hunter. I am a member of our local League of Women Voters, uh, San Jose, Santa Clara branch, and I'm a neighbor. I live in the Creekside neighborhood near the Laurelwood School, which unfortunately is scheduled to be closed. So, uh, so tonight, or are you going to be my advance or two? All right, next, please. So I shared with some of you earlier that the League of Women Voters is celebrating its 100th anniversary on Valentine's Day this year. And um, we're a nonpartisan organization, meaning that we don't support candidates or parties. Um, instead, what we do is we study issues and we develop uh, positions, the League of Women Voter positions on those issues, and sometimes are out there advocating and working with our elected representatives to persuade them to um, go the way we'd like them to go. We also we have two branches. So we have this group that um, does the advocacy, the public policy advocacy. And then we have a group which does what I'm doing tonight, which is education. And so um, someone asked me earlier, what was the League of Women Voters position on Major E, and I said, well, you have to look that up because I'm here to educate tonight, not to advocate. So, all right, so next slide, please. So tonight, I don't know if I have time for all of this, but um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about voters' choice. Major E, which is a city major, Proposition 13. Major J, which is being was put on the ballot by the Eastside Union High School District, and Major V which was put on by the Evergreen School District. All right, next one, please. So I, have you heard of the Voters' Choice Act? And did you see, did you see the ballot drop off box right outside the library here? Um, this year we're doing things a little bit differently in our county. Um, every single one of us who's registered to vote will receive a ballot in the mail. And, um, you can return that ballot by mail, you can drop it off in a box like what's outside here, the library, or you can walk it into a voting center. Um, in addition to that, rather than you um, going to your precinct, having a polling place in every single precinct, instead we're having voting centers. And 22 of those voting centers are opening on February 22nd. And they'll be open through March 3rd, the day of the election. So you can vote early, but not often, just once. Um, and then there'll be 88 more voting centers that will open just from February 29th through March 3rd. You can vote at any of them. Um, I just got my ballot tonight. And so in that, there's a list of where all of the drop-off places are is a list of where all of the voting centers are. You can vote, you can take your ballot, you can walk in and vote at any voting center. So if, if there's one that's near where you work, you can vote there. If there's one near your child's child care center, you can vote there. If there's one near your home, you can vote there. It, um, unlike the precinct polling places, you, you don't have to go to a designated place. And hopefully, because they're open for 11 days or four days. Um, this is going to make it easier for everyone to participate in our elections. All right, next one, please. And furthermore, if you haven't registered to vote, you can do it online at this uh, website, or you can actually walk into a voting center and register right there and vote at the same time. So big changes, big changes this year in our, in our county. It's actually a reflection of an act that was passed by the California State Legislature and signed into law by the governor. And other, other counties have already implemented it. I think there's like 15 counties that are already doing this. And so now Santa Clara County is doing it. This will be our first one. So we'll see how it goes. All right, on to the next one. So when we're going to talk about these ballot measures, and I'm just going to give you information. You're the one who has to decide how to vote. So, um, oops, did we skip one? 
impact of learning them. So the questions you know, to entertain when you're thinking about how you should vote are, do you agree with what this measure is trying to accomplish? And do you think it's going to make for good government? The other thing is, does, has it been written well? Does it address more than one issue? So maybe you're feeling like, yes, on this part of it, but no on that part. Um, is it going to create confusion if it's adopted? Is it going to end up in the courts because it's not clear um, what its intent is and how it would be implemented? Does it create its own revenue source or does it try to earmark money that um, is already being like general fund funds that are trying to earmark those for a specific purpose? And then, of course, find out if you can who are the real supporters and the real opponents. And watch out for those ads that are attempting to um, mislead you. All right, so the first, the next one, please. The first measure we're going to talk about tonight is San Jose Measure E, which um, is a real property transfer tax. It's a municipal code amendment. It only takes a simple majority to be adopted. And if adopted, on, when we vote on March 3rd, it would begin, it would actually go into effect on July 1st, 2020. So pretty quick, huh? So Measure E, next one, please. Excuse me. Yes. How did they get around the two thirds vote? Um, we'll talk about See, that. That makes me suspicious right away. We'll talk about that, yeah. Um, so this is the question as it will appear on the ballot to fund general city of San Jose services, including affordable housing and helping homeless residents move into shelters and permanent housing, shall an ordinance be adopted enacting a real property transfer tax, exempting transfers under $2 million adjusted for inflation. So next one, please. So as background, we have a real property transfer tax in place right now. And it's $3.30 per $1,000 based on the actual sales price. And the revenue is used for parks and libraries and firefighters and other city facilities. And it generates about $38 million a year. Next one, please. So this, this measure would increase the revenue from the real property transfer um, from one entity to another based on the fair market value or the sales price. And it would apply to residential and commercial property. And when we say commercial property, that includes corporations, partnerships, and LLCs, limited liability corporations. It would exempt property is valued at under $2 million. And I'll talk about that $2 million threshold, just remember that's a $2 million threshold, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. It also exempts property that's being transferred as a gift or inheritance, divorce, a court-ordered foreclosure, partnerships, that kind of thing. So um, there are some exemptions. Next one, please. Now, this gets to the gentleman's question. It is a general tax for unrestricted general purposes. That's why it only takes a <coughs> simple majority to pass. However, the current city council has voted that the revenues made from this additional transfer tax would be spent to increase the supply of affordable housing in San Jose. 85% of the revenue would be used to increase affordable housing availability in San Jose. 10% would be used to provide homeless prevention activities and rental assistance. And then 5% of those funds would be used for overhead administrative costs. Yes? <coughs> increased supply of affordable housing. You know what I mean by that? Is the city going to build houses? No. Sell them? 
No, it subsidizes, <coughs> it subsidizes the cost of building affordable housing. So houses are built by a private contractor in it. Yes, actually it's usually um, built by a nonprofit. Affordable housing for extremely low income and low income folks are usually built by a nonprofit developer. And but still they need funds. They get funds from a variety of sources, but they need funds to subsidize the cost of building that housing so that it can be affordable for people that are at the lower end of the income spectrum. Let me say that most of the uh, value of the property that is provided to my early uh, assessment is the land itself. How do they figure out? I mean, they could come up with money for the house, but they have to buy the land. The land is it's like it's 75, 80 percent of yeah. the assessed value of the property. That's so true. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I don't know. I don't know. That's the, you should have uh, like, what is it? Charities Housing come and talk to you about how they build affordable housing. Okay. And how they manage those costs. Um, it's, a, it's marvelous that they can do it, and it's not easy. Need it for so. a future meeting. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> they do a great presentation. So, all right, next one, please. So the measure does provide because we as taxpayers we want to know that our money is being spent and managed appropriately. It does provide for annual financial audits. Um, the, the city manager would provide yearly reports of how much revenue was collected from this transfer tax. There would be a community oversight committee that would be put into place that would review the expenditures to be sure that those tax revenues were being used for the purpose that we have, that the city council has voted to use them for. Just a sec. And um, the measure itself can actually be repealed by the city council but the rate increases would require a vote of the people. So they can eliminate this tax if they want, but they cannot increase it. Yes? Is this a sales tax or a property tax? It's a, it's a transfer tax. So at the time a, a piece of property changes ownership from one person okay, so or one corporation to another. Case of the transfer. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, next one, please. So, what is the tax? If the value of the property is less than $2 million, then it's exempt, not subject to this tax. If it's between two and five million dollars, it's three quarters of a percent. And it's on the full value of the property. So it's not like, okay. And then if it's between five and ten million, it's a percent, and if it's over ten million, it's one and a half percent. So just by way of example, if the value of a home at the time it sold is $3 million, then you're talking about a transfer tax of $22,500. On the other hand, if it's $7 million, then that tax would be $70,000. Yes? Is this a property for business and residential? Yes, it's residential and commercial. And by commercial, that means corporations, partnerships, and limited liability. Okay, and the, and the uh, city council uh, uh, change that to just uh, business? I don't believe so. They can repeal the whole thing, but they can't. They can't pick and choose. So, um, all right. So where are we? Oh, and finally. They anticipate that it would generate about $70 million a year. All right, next one, please. The measure provides that every five years, beginning, is it July 1st? No, July 1st, 2025, that the exemption threshold, that $2 million, that it can be, um, adjusted based on the consumer price index. 
It can't go down. It cannot be less than $2 million. It can only go up. So as time goes by and our properties go up in value, that threshold below which properties are exempt will also go up. And the city council can increase the exemption threshold at any time, but they can't change the tax rates, okay? So next one, please. So the supporters say that our homeless community has increased 40% since the year 2017. And there's wide support from community groups. So just as an example, I will give you some of the community groups that support this. The La, the La Foundation of Silicon Valley, Neighbors for an Affordable San Jose, Working Partnerships USA, Somos Mayfair, Sacred Heart Community Services, Silicon Valley at Home, Veterans Supportive Services, and our local branch of Habitat for Humanity, and people acting in community together, PACT, are all community organizations that support this um, measure. They say, supporters say that it's gonna be easier for residents to live in San Jose, and furthermore, it only taxes properties at this point in time more than $2 million, which represents about 2% of all of the property owners in our city. Next. Yeah. Opponents say, okay, enough is enough, that since 2014, we've adopted new citywide taxes that cost our taxpayers $92 million annually and two new countywide taxes. They also point out, as the question was raised, that Measure E is a general tax. So city council can spend the money on anything they choose. And they finally say, we'll make it more expensive to buy properties for development so fewer homes will get built. So any questions about Measure E? All right. Well, yeah. Oh, sure, I do know that, actually. Okay, so, yeah, I told you who the supporters were, right? <laughs> Opponents, Citizens for Fiscal Responsibility, the Silicon Valley Taxpayers Association, the Bay Area Homeowners Network, and the Republican Party of Silicon, uh, Santa Clara County and the Libertarian Party of Santa Clara County. I did a little bit of my own research and the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the Realtors are neutral. Oh, they're neutral. So okay. In terms of the way the package was put together, hmm. to have that neutral position of the Chamber of Realtors, that maybe they don't really want to do it, but they understand the magnitude of the problem, so they're just going to be neutral. Yeah. Yes. It's been a serious problem for San Jose ever since the Governor Brown eliminated the redevelopment agency because when we had a redevelopment agency, we had funds that were earmarked for affordable housing in San Jose. And we were spending the money wisely and doing a good job. Um, other cities were not, and that's why Governor Brown eliminated the program. They were abusing it. So um, this is a, a, a method to replace some of those funds. Yes. So the uh, two million dollars—that's a one-time uh, assessment when the home is sold. Yes, it's yes, it's that two million dollar threshold applies to the fair market value or the sales price at the time it's transferred from one entity to another. So, so there's no just because there's no annual cost; it's just a one-time. No, so. no, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So shall we move on to Proposition Thirteen? Okay, so this is um, a California ballot proposition. It's a legislative statute, meaning that our state Senate and Assembly both passed this, this measure, and now it's coming to the voters for ratification. And its official title is long, 
is public preschool K-12 and College Health and Safety Bond Act of 2020. So, so this Proposition 13 authorizes $15 billion of bonds for school facility repair, construction, and modernization. By way of background, it's pretty impressive. California provides public education for 9.2 million students. There's 10,000 preschools and K-12 schools, 115 community colleges, 23 CSU campuses, and 10 UC campuses. And the state does help cover um, facility costs for all of those. Next one, please. So the $15 billion gets broken down into two big chunks. The first one being $9 billion, $9 billion sorry, for preschools and K-12. And you can see the biggest piece of that $9, that $9 billion is $5.2 billion for modernization of existing schools. And then another big chunk, uh, $2.8 billion for new construction, and then half a billion for charter schools and half a billion for career technical education. And then the next chunk is $6 billion, and that's for the higher education. And it's $2 billion each for community colleges, CSU campuses, and UC campuses. Next one, please. Since the year 2002, $45 billion has been authorized by voters in California, except for about $8 billion of that, it's all been allocated. There's more, there's more applications sitting in our state's um, offices waiting for approval than there are funds remaining. And that's why we have this bill on our ballot this year. They need more money to continue to improve and construct schools. So the projected cost of, should this be passed, $15 billion um, bond, the projected cost is $740 million a year for 35 years. That represents about half a percent of the California um, general fund budget. The total payback with interest, principal and interest, is $26 billion. So <coughs> this, this bill, in addition to being um, a bond measure, is also trying to address some issues in terms of allocations of these state funds. And so let's see if I can find, okay. So it has, it's made some provisions, which I'm gonna talk about. But it's made some provisions to try to address concerns that small and less well-off school districts that are unable to raise the funds needed to qualify for state assistance are getting the state funds because they're unable to. In the, up until now, the requirement has been that school districts be able to contribute about the same amount that the state contributes to the cost of a project. And they're also um, trying to make some provisions that address the housing shortage in the communities and on college campuses. And it's the very first bond issue that is providing for um, preschools to be eligible for funding. So it's an, interesting, it's an interesting bond measure. So with that in mind, that is trying to address um, those issues, then one of the things that's happened is that it has, in the past, let me see, I've got to get my notes here because it's complicated. In the past, if, um, if the school wanted to access state funds <coughs> to help them with this project, the state, would, if it was for a new building, the state would um, only fund 50%. If it was for modernization, the state would fund 60%. But what they're saying with this one is that 
Well, they know that there's some schools where the property values are assessed lower and um, there's more low income students and they just have more trouble raising that 50% or 40% of their project's cost. And so they're saying for districts that are um, wrestling with those kinds of issues, they can um, receive an additional 5% from the state. So for new construction, they could receive 55% of the cost of their project from the state. If it was for modernization, they could receive up to 65% for um, that project. So I think we can move on to the next one. Thank you. Where do they get the money for this? From us. The state? Yeah, how much do we have to pay? Okay, so the state pays back, it's unlike, it's unlike our school bonds, the state pays back the bonds that it sells with its general funds. So with the, the tax dollars that we're pumping in to the state, that's how these bonds get paid back. So our property tax goes up? No, it doesn't. How are the bonds? It's from the general fund. General fund comes from your income tax. And there's no income tax. It's not like it's not like a school bond where yes, there's you know they say okay, so three cents on a hundred dollars or three tenths of a cent on a hundred dollars, you can see that in your property tax bill. It's not that way with this. It comes out of the time. I'm confused now. So it's not coming from our property taxes. No. It's coming from your income tax. Our regular income tax. Right. So There, okay, so for instance, um, you'll see in one of the arguments that this year, actually for a couple of years now, the state has had a surplus. And so they have monies, at least the last few years they've had monies that they could easily pay this back. This is a half of, per, half of a percent, the payback, $740 million a year, is half of a percent of what the state spends every year out of its general fund. So we're talking about a tiny little part of the state budget, a half of a percent. And it's just coming out of the revenues that they get from all of us when we pay our income taxes. Yes? I have a question. How many bonds are still outstanding and how many bonds are still paying off? Okay, so I... This would be a new bond yes. which had to be paid off but many bonds are not paid off by now. Okay, so I, I did mention that of the school, for bonds that were for schools, that since 2002, we've approved $45 billion worth of bonds, and that all of those have been um, spent, except almost about $8 billion haven't been spent, but there's projects in the queue for that. There's an interesting, in the, in your, California State, you know, the information packet that you get when it's time to vote, there's a really great um, article in there about California State bonds and, and how we're rated and, and that kind of thing. So I suggest you read that. I'm not really prepared to present on that tonight. So, um, okay, so. Tony? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Does this have an effect on the local districts from raising funds, you know, bond issues, so Yep, we'll get, we'll get there, we'll get there. So the other thing is that in the past, um, school bonds have been issued on a first come, first serve. So if you're a school district and you get your, your application in early, then you get funded. And if you get it in late, well, then maybe you don't get it funded. So rather than doing first come, first serve, they're prioritizing projects, school district projects that would um, address health and life safety issues. And they're also next in priority are those school districts that maybe haven't gotten much state assistance over the past decade or two because they're unable to raise the funds that are needed to qualify for that state assistance. So those two things are the top priorities. Um, following below that are projects that 
have to do with lead in our water, in the school's water, and, and then those projects that are using unionized labor get priority over other. And every school district that's applying for a grant from the state um, is going to be required to put together a five-year facility master plan. And for colleges that are looking for money, they're going to be asked to prepare a five-year plan to expand affordable housing for students. Now, about the question about um, does it affect the monies that school districts can raise, yes. Let's see. So, for instance, we do two of the measures I'm talking about tonight are school bond measures being issued by school districts. And currently, they can only um, have a bond measure that represents one and a quarter percent of the assessed value of the property in their district. This um, measure would increase it to two percent, that they could issue bond measures for up to two percent of the assessed value of the property in their district. That's if you're a K to 12, like, so if you're at a green school district, that applies to you. If you're the East Side Union School District, then the current um, percentage is two and a half percent, and it would raise it to four percent. But at the same time they do that, um, they're taking away some of the school's um, district's ability to assess developer fees. So if you're a school district and and um, there's a multifamily housing unit being built near a major transit stop, then this bond measure says, uh, yeah, this bond measure says that no, you cannot charge that developer any fee. If you're, uh, if you're a school district and somebody's building a multifamily housing unit in your district, but it's not near a transit stop, then you can only charge them 80% of the developer fee that you're currently charging. So while it lets them increase their ability to raise money through bonds, it's taking away some of the school district's ability to raise money through developer fees. Now, So I think we can go on to the next one. Thank you. So the supporters say that it meets needs for safer and healthier schools, that it helps pay for needed repairs and security upgrades. And the opponents say that the state borrowing $15 billion, when it, and it costs $26 billion to borrow that much, while sitting on a $21 billion surplus is fiscally irresponsible and that higher taxes will eventually be needed to repay the bond debt. So, let me see, I have who the supporters and opponents are. So some of the supporters are the California Professional Firefighters, the California Teacher Association, the California School Nurse Association, and the California State PTA. Oh, another one the Association of California School Administrators. And the only opponent I was able to find was the Harvard, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. So, so any questions about Prop 13? Yeah? Is there any backstory as to why it ended up being called Proposition 13? Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's really, yeah, that's really something, isn't it? Now we have two famous propositions. They say that they renumber, that yeah. they, every decade they start renumbering yeah. the propositions. And so um, <laughs> they're really 13 so unlucky. They, so anyway, we had 12 propositions on the previous ballot from the time they started renumbering. And so this is just the luck of the draw. You get 13. Because people are going to think they're voting for Proposition 13. It could be. Is that because those um, districts could fund or something like that? Or? 
No, those funds, as far as I know, I don't know what these opponents, when they talk about a $21 billion surplus, I don't know exactly what they're talking about. But when Governor Brown was the governor, you remember, you know, we had to dig our way out of a big, deep hole. And um, so he made a provision that when we got to the good news days, like we're in right now, that if we had a surplus, then a certain amount had to be put into reserves, and a certain amount had to be used to pay off debt or to pay into a pension liability fund. And so I think that when you're talking about that $21 billion surplus, they're saying instead of doing all those things, that we could use it to, for this purpose. I'm not 100% sure, but yes? Yeah, I'm just wondering what the justification is. Almost all the school districts around here are closing schools. So what is the justification for going out and issuing new bonds for, for new schools? Good question. The other thing to understand is that there's chances are we're here in the million dollar ghetto, so to speak. Um, but where they're building, where everybody's growing families is crazy or wherever else, where they may be building schools there. So they're not over here where we're established. They're lower um, numbers, but probably where there's new developments and the young people are living. So that's very Yeah, I'm not going to argue. <laughs> That's a statement against. <laughs> this is different than it's been done in the past. Um, there's criteria that deals with those growth areas that are building new schools or those economically depressed areas that don't have the tax base to do bonds. And it's really leveraging the local money with the state money. Um, and that $21 billion is the rainy day fund that we're going to need. Yeah, at least some of it is being put into that reserve, that rainy day fund. Okay, any other questions about this one? Am I, how much more time do I have, Jerry? 15. 15, okay. All right, so then I think we can move on to Measure J, the East Side Union High School District Measure. So, this is an interesting one too. The question on the ballot is, to allow local high school teachers and staff members to live in the community in which they work and improve the school district's ability to attract and retain highly qualified employees by constructing teacher, staff, rental housing, shall the Eastside Union High School District measure authorizing $60 million of bonds be adopted with legal rates raising approximately $4.1 million for annual repayment while bonds are outstanding, projected levies of less than three-tenths of a cent per $100 assessed valuation, annual audit, citizens' oversight. That's the question. And for this one to be adopted, then we need 55% of the vote to be yes. So, next one, please. So the proposal is that the Eastside Union High School District would issue and sell general obligation bonds up to $60 million. And they would use the revenue from those bonds to construct and acquire below market rate rental housing for district teachers and staff. And the housing 
housing would be in the communities where the district teachers and staff work. And specifically, the East Side Union High School District has um, a nice little plot of land where their district office is on North Capitol Avenue. And they're saying, I mean, I think they've done quite a bit of homework about this to try to figure it out. But of that, I think they own like 20 acres there. And there's some of it just sitting there empty. And so they would take, their plan primarily is to take four and a half acres of that land and build 100 units of housing, um, one, two, and three bedroom units. And it would be available for their teachers and staff to rent. And those the people that are lucky enough to get in there, um, into that housing, would be below market rate rent. So it would be affordable to our teachers and staff. Um, they can live there for up to seven years. And they're modeling it after something that the San Mateo Community College District has already done and has had quite a bit of success with. <clears throat> so, all right, let's all right, so let's talk about, they're going to, again, we want to know that our money is being used right. So on the previous slide, it said something about establishing an independent citizens oversight committee to make sure that those bond funds are being expended for the purpose that we voted to have them. And then in addition to that um, community oversight committee, we would also have annual performance audits conducted by the school board um, to ensure, again, that those bond funds are being expended appropriately. There would be annual financial audits conducted by the school board, and um, bond funds cannot be used for teacher or administrator salaries, nor can they be used for school operating expenses. So, Okay, one more slide. So the fiscal effects of this bond measure are that taxes would be levied on all taxable property in the district to repay these bonds. And the best estimate of the average tax rate would be 0 0.0027 cents per $100 of assessed value. So for a home, if you had a, with an assessed value of $800,000, the additional annual tax burden would be $21.60. And they would expect to be levying this tax through the year 2048-2049. And again, you're not only paying back the principal, you're paying back the interest. So the total cost of this $60 million bond issue would be about $116.5 million. So next one, please. So the arguments for this measure are that we have a critical shortage of affordable housing in the East Side Union High School District, which prevents teachers and staff from living in the community where they work, and it makes it difficult to attract and retain highly qualified teachers. The bond funds will be used to construct or acquire about 100 one-bedroom, two-bedroom, and three-bedroom high-quality housing units that would be available exclusively to Eastside Union High School District teachers and staff and rented at low market rate. <coughs> and that there would be rigorous accountability. Next one, please. The argument against is that school districts should not be in the business of building housing for its teachers and staff. So, any questions of that measure, Jay? Yes. It's been a while, and so my memory may not so be accurately, but I think. So I served on a bond oversight committee, and mm -hmm. probably other people in this room have too. So, but if I remember correctly, at that time, it was, so you have, besides the contractors, and let's say the Joe's construction or whatever, and Joe up here is managing all the camera guys and the drill guys, whatever. Besides that, there's another um, management company that's like managing the whole project and managing all these contractors. This management company 
I believe, can charge up to 5%. So that's a chunk of change. And I remember looking at that when we went through the first time, because it seems like there's a whole lot of overhead money to me. And so a quick, I think it comes out to like, um, and $60 million, what is that, like $3 million, I think, or something like that. So anyways, I just thought I'd share that little tidbit of information here, because, um, I don't know, it seems like every time I turn around, I'm being asked to go. Well, thank you, Alan. It might, it might, to share the that, that is one of the, I mean, it's really a, a win-win situation in as much as, yeah, the, the school employees are going to pay rent. They're going to pay it to the district. The district owns the land, they own the building, um, and then they're going to receive rent, right? And so, uh, one of the things I read in one of the articles, it was a Spotlight article, was that then, because I think it's kind of idealistic that um, a new teacher in seven years is going to be able to save up enough and be making a high enough salary to be able to buy a home in our district. Um, but anyway, one of the things that the article suggested was that they might actually take the revenue from the rent and help the employees make those down payments so that they could get into housing. So, I mean, we really want good teachers and we have to find a way to house them. And um, this is one way to do it. Um, yes? So, yeah, I hear your argument that you need a lot of good teachers, but uh, if the argument is being placed up there, are you willing to uh, entertain arguments that we can provide you for your future presentation? Well, I'm hearing them, so. <laughs> well, okay. and it's that's not your contract that's info. Because there's, there's quite a bit of argument <laughs> It's not my, I, I am not advocating to pass this um, bill. I absolutely am not advocating. I'm sharing information and um, possibilities. So. Yes? I have a question. Is there an exception for seniors on the phone? Yes. Yeah. How come you didn't mention it? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Next time I will. <laughs> Bonds have exemptions or just property taxes? Um, I don't know exactly how it works because I've never sought, sought one, but I think I, I did read that the seniors could um, petition or apply for an exemption, a waiver. Yeah, that's what it is, a waiver from the county. I knew that was true for parcel taxes. Mm -hmm. We have it at, a, at Evergreen, yeah. but I was told that it doesn't work that way for bonds. If they figure out a way, that's great. Um, well, I could be wrong too because I didn't include it in my presentation, but I believe I read that. Yeah. I think I think Jim is right because I know we're blasted in the villager with the parcel task, parcel task. I've never ever seen it for bonds. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay, so um, maybe not, sir. Maybe you're not going to get a waiver. That's right. Okay. Um, should we move on to Measure B? I don't really have a lot to say about Measure B. I just got my ballot. My, my mail comes like at six o'clock at night, and so. Um, Can we speak on that? Pardon? Can we speak on that? Well, just a second. Um, yeah, you can't. You can't. This is an educational event. Um, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's any questions about the specifics. Okay, all right. Um, so anyway, all I could find up until I got my ballot tonight was what will appear on the ballot. This is put on the um, ballot by the Evergreen School District, and we're being asked to acquire computers and classroom technology for improved student access. 
Install campus security slash emergency notification and communication alarms and systems. And renovate and modernize the aging classrooms and facilities throughout the district. So the Evergreen Elementary School District's measure authorizing $125 million in bonds with legal interest rates, projected yearly tax rates averaging less than three cents per $100 of assessed valuation, raising an average $7.3 million per year for 18 years. Annual audits and citizens oversight be adopted. And so because it's a school bond measure, it does require 55% of a positive vote to be adopted. And um, next one, please. So what I could find, and I couldn't find much, was that the supporters say that this will improve classroom technology throughout the district while improving student safety and campus security. And the opponents say that the original intent of bond measures is being stretched because Bonds are intended for long-term capital improvements that will outlive or will last as long as the financing period. So technology has that short lifetime. So, so, so. A technical, just a technical statement, mm -hmm. these are not 30-year bonds. No. They're short-term bonds. Right? So that, that is a difference. The short-term bonds for technology are used because technology usually operates within a short period of time. So the, Why is that the short term, Jim? I'm not trying to I'm not trying to I'm not trying to I'm just pointing out a difference. It's not a 30-year bond, it's a it's a five-year bond. Okay. Thank you for that. So, That's helpful. Sorry, yeah. I'm Bonnie Mason, I'm also on the school board with uh -huh. Jim. And so the actually the difference between this and a regular capital bond, which is usually a 30-year bond, is that this is a, a uh, because this is for technology upgrades, a lot of this is for technology mm -hmm. upgrades which need to be refreshed every so often. So rather than having a 30-year long-term, right. a series of incremental phasing of bonds over a period of time. Right. And I guess that's why they say the payback period is like 18 years or something. Yeah. Yes? Uh, question for the school board. Uh, we're closing down two schools. Is anything to make a profit on those two schools or have these two empty schools make money for the district and uh, figure it out? So, so there are um, plans to do so that. that we don't have to pass bonds. <laughs> we can talk about that for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to make trouble. But no, no, I, I appreciate your question. Uh, I would yes, say the two schools can make some money for us. They yeah, it just seems one hundred twenty-five million dollars is, is awfully large for, for computers and, and technological. So sure it's not strictly for that, though, right? As well. Yeah. So safety upgrades and infrastructure in addition to technology. Okay, well, using the, the example from the previous uh, uh, measure, J, if you have a, a, a property worth uh, 800000 with with the rate there, that, that if I have made a mistake here, it's $240 a house. Yeah. If, if yes, all right. the bonds were out at the same time, but they're, they're because Stag these are short-term bonds, they stagger. Right, so you, you you release a certain number of bonds, and then you release maybe another set of bonds in two years, but the first set of bonds don't last 30 years; they're paid off in five. So you don't usually have 100, you won't have 125 thousand dollars, million, sorry, million dollars worth of bonds out at one time. But the, the ballot measure actually says that the assessment will be about three cents per 100 dollars. Mm -hmm. Assess the valuation. So you're right. If your assess your assess valuation is usually lower than your market um, valuation. So, but you're right then. Okay. Um, should we wrap it up here? Yeah. So we have to be present to win. And finally, uh, the next one, please. If you haven't heard of Voters Edge, I really highly recommend it to you. It's a fantastic website. You go to it, you enter your address and your zip code, and it, it figures out what precinct you're in and what's going to be on your ballot, and it brings it up. And you can click on the different candidates, and you can read their statements. They've been interviewed, um, many of them by League of Women Voter um, folks, and 
the same questions are asked of each one of the candidates running for the same office, and you can compare answers. And it's just it's a fantastic way to be an informed voter. So I commend it to you. Thank you so much for your attention, all your good questions. Please feel free to reach out to our office. Le Boulanger. 
10.30 to 11.30. And there are um, appointments about five to 10 minutes so that she can get a chance to chat with everybody. And um, it's gonna be first come first serve, so there's no appointments. But we look forward to seeing everybody there. So the Bull on Share at San Jose? Yes. We have a flyer up on her Facebook page, and I'm happy to share that with Jeremy so he can distribute that out to the mailing list. And that was? Thursday, February 13th. Thank you. What date did you say that the council was going to start looking at prioritizing? Priority um, setting session will be February 25th. And the mid-year budget review will be this coming Tuesday on the 11th. Yes? So you mentioned earlier about equity. <coughs> So the first session we were looking at the history of the city of San Jose and how um, there has been a history of segregation or uh, racial biases that has been embedded into the way that we have created city programs and city policies. So we're trying to learn from that to move forward to make sure that if there are any inequitable processes that we have, learning to how to undo that but also move forward from that. So the very first session was talking about what is equity, and then the second session coming up will be a continuous conversation on uh, how we are hoping to proceed and also looking at definitions. So this is very in the early phases, nothing has yet been decided, and this is be a, a great opportunity for the community to weigh in. What time is that? That will be on Monday at 1.30 to 4.30. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And we'll just move right into the Evergreen Elementary School District report. Looks like we'll have Trustee Jim Zito give the update. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm uh, pro tem this year, so that means Vice President. If Lena was here, she'd be giving it to you. Cool. Um, so we completed our, our public meetings about school consolidation. There was a meeting this past Monday at um, Sheboy Middle. Prior to that, the prior Monday before that, there was an open meeting at uh, Kumbi Oak Middle School, and we gave opportunity for people to come up and give us their feeling about the school closures and any other comments that they, they uh, had for us. So the board was there, the entire board was there, both meetings, to just hear the community, what they had to say, what their concerns were. Those meetings have, have happened. Uh, the next meeting is really the vote. So on February 13th, the week from today, there will be the school board meeting. I think it's going to be in the gym, right? The yeah. be the gym, so there's enough room for everybody. And um, the superintendent's recommendation of closing Dub Hill and Laurelwood will be on the agenda, and the school board will have to take action on that to make it official one way or the other. Um, there will be some discussion as far as how the decision, the recommendation, made, uh, some next steps if, if in fact it does pass, and um, what to expect at the site, so the conversation about whether or not the site should be leased out, those kinds of things, those will be discussed in some broad sense. There's no specific plan that will be discussed that night, but the overview of kind of what we, where we see going from here, assuming that the, the closure passes. Um, then we have Second interim report as far as budget is also going to be coming up. This is either the next meeting or the March meeting. So both of those uh, school consolidation and budgets are pretty important things to make sure that uh, we stay on top of. Um, I always urge anyone to come to the meetings and, and understand what's going on at your school district. Uh, we're also starting the bilingual programs at Hollyoak, uh, which is starting next year. We're going to open up a bilingual program to have uh, at the kindergarten level to have students come and, and learn, you know, uh, both Spanish. Uh, we're doing Spanish bilingual this time. There's been some discussion about other languages as well, but we're going we're gonna to pilot with, uh, with Spanish this first year. So we are trying to expand the programs. Again, part of our uh, strategic goal of attracting and retaining students to stave off the declining enrollment that we have. Any questions? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Jim. All right, so that's.
that's our meeting. Yeah, well, we're going to go around and we'll do announcements. I actually got two. So uh, just, you know, for our March meeting, the steering committee is looking at uh, having a public safety themed meeting. So we want to, we're reaching out to Police Chief Eddie Garcia's office to have the police chief come and uh, talk about, you know, some crime trends that we're seeing in the city and then also specifically here in District 8. Uh, we're also looking at having, uh, having crime prevention come in after and do like a neighborhood watch type meeting uh, for you know, tips and some other things to, so we can all be vigilant. And then also uh, for April, we we're talking about bringing in PG&E, having representatives from PG&E to talk about you know, some of the blackouts, the forced blackouts. I know my family, we were hit. Uh, you know, to talk about you know, what are the thresholds that they see you know, to and talk a little bit about you know, what they're going to be doing moving forward. So you definitely don't want to miss March and April right here in, right here in this building for those. And then secondly, uh, who knows that we elect, we caucus for our neighborhood commissioners, right? Nobody knows that? Bonnie knows. <laughs> but uh, uh, we have a neighborhoods commission. We have two commissioners for each district in the city of San Jose. I am one of those two. Uh, we're going to be electing in Nicola Adraus, and a lot of you in the room know Nicole. She's the other one. But uh, we're going to be up for uh, re-election. Uh, both of us are not re-running, I believe. So there are two open seats for our neighborhood commissioner. They're elected caucus style. That means we caucus as a district, and we vote and elect our next commissioners. So they tap me to, to reserve the library and help promote the election. So the election will be March 7th at the Evergreen Branch Library over on E1 Road. We chose that one because it's a little bit more central in the district. So it's a little bit more accessible to the west side of the district and other parts of, of Evergreen. So that'll be March 7th from uh, 10 to 10, 10 to 12.30. And anyone can vote. And if you're interested in running, you just go to the city website. I can go ahead and reach out via the, the District 8 Roundtable uh, Yahoo group and share the link for anyone that's interested. It's very fun. I think there's, I think there's three year services. I uh, can't remember. So we'll go ahead and uh, continue with announcements. So two minutes. Mr. Wenzel? Yes. How many folks are all aware about the light rail extension going to the East Bridge? There's plans to permanently shut down two lanes. Well, talking to the engineer on it is that that is unnecessary. So what I've done is inquire a little further what the powers to be and why are we shutting down two lanes if it's unnecessary. And they've all hit under rocks. So, what happens if you look at measure three funds? Measure three funds are only for, to be used for not to uh, increase congestion. However, VTA has admitted that this will permanently increase congestion in the area. So here we go again, another pop, probably misuse of public funds. So, I want to ask this organization to consider requesting that the grand jury investigate this for misuse of funds. Because what's going on is that we're going to actually force families to not be with each other, right? Because you have to sit another 10 or 15 minutes in traffic. It's unnecessary. It looks like a pork bill. So what happens is uh, already one organization has agreed to, to uh, request this a grand jury investigation and it's a Creek neighborhood association. But I would like that this organization also consider to join into that. The, uh, so what, it, what happens is over there, the little fire has a little bit of, uh, has a link there. And there you can see the conversation with the elected officials and how and why they gone on quiet. And so I appreciate you folks take a look. We come to forums, we got a little homework. And then, then come back and be prepared to vote. The next thing, the next stage on this would be actually be going to uh, our uh, committee meeting, and uh, then so the, really the vote would be to to enable our our roundtable uh, committee, I forgot the name of it, steering committee, steering committee, <laughs> to actually then uh, come up with wording to, just to request this this uh, grand jury investigation. Again, this is 
it, all, all information has been received. It's unnecessary to shut those those two lanes down. Thank you. Are you a member, sir? Excuse me? Am I a member? Yeah. Well, yeah. Am I, am I yes, allowed sir. To speak? Yes, sir. So my name is Craig Ferguson. I am the president of the Thompson Creek Neighborhood Association. I would just like to clarify that uh, we did not go ahead and decide to uh, um, go with the grand jury, as Glenn was saying. So he brought it up at our meeting, but mm -hmm. we have not yet decided to go ahead with the grand jury. As he just Minutes show otherwise, sir. <coughs> All right, any other announcements? All right, Robert. Um, Jim and Bonnie, before we uh, were able to arrive, I had talked about the general plan task force, yeah. and I said that we had uh, sent the letter for the study issues to planning this past Monday, and that we've been working on it, and explained that it's a 42 member committee, and if each person were to speak, we might have 30 seconds on an issue. So, um, with the Evergreen East Hills development policy being so complicated, there may not, and the staff report not being out until maybe one week before it, there may not be time to have any kind of detailed position, and it may be that our position is only that there needs to be a task force that can further delve into the information. Um, you may want to comment on that. But then I think, Jeremy, we need some time at the front end of the March meeting to talk about it. Um, do you think we will really be able to have a position without more information from staff? So I just, uh, you know, I'm on the task force with Jim, so I don't want to make an opinion on what will be said or not be said, but I will say, as Robert has said, that they are going to task force will be discussing this at its March meeting, and Jim can clarify this as well. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for the community to have a long uh, time to understand what it is, and so that's why it's important for Robert and others to ask for a clarification on a lot of different issues that will come up. Otherwise, what tends to happen is it does a week before we get the review. So, so uh, that's why it's really important that we know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So thank you to Robert for coming, and thank you to for the letter that was sent this morning. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. I know the steering committee is weighing in on some of the, on the letter and yes. other things. Great. Any other announcements before we wrap up? So if anyone wants to pay due, see Dan here. He's the money man. $20 for the entire year. It's only February. So. And we'll see you guys next uh, in March. Thanks a lot.